Jay, thank you for being here, my man. I really appreciate you taking the time. Really excited to dive into you, your story, and what you're all about here today. Danny, thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Of course. First off, I got to wish you a happy birthday. I know your birthday was three days ago by the time we were. It was indeed. So thank you for um, for being born, man. How was yeah, your birthday? Well, <laughs> it was good. It was good. You know, um, the last, uh, since the age of 30, I've been doing, like every year has been doing a little reflection a year for like, and it's like with 30 things at 30, 31 things at 31, 32 things at 32. And I've got to 37. And I was like, do you know what? Let's do seven things. <laughs> <at 37." laughs> Let's start again because I'm going to be getting to 40 and 50 doing this. And I just don't want to be thinking every year of 40 things and 50 things. I was just like, well, let's just, let's just, let's just go there. 30, seven things at 37. And next year will be eight things at 38. So. Does thinking about age, like does having your birthday make you think about age in a way that you otherwise don't throughout the year? No, not really. I mean, like for a lot of certain occasions during the year, I, I'm more reflective. I'm a very reflective person. You know, I always you know, think back on my week. And as you said, when we first met, what your biggest win is. And, you know, a lot of people can't tell you that because they don't. They, they don't review their day. They don't review their week. And for me, Christmas and birthdays are very much a reflection. Christmas is very much, have I done the things that I wanted to do this year? That, you know, what things work, what things didn't, and what am I going to change next year? And for a birthday, it's more a reflection on what things helped me survive and thrive another year on the planet. And I just think back to a lot of things since that period of, you know, things maybe that I um, spoke about a year ago and, and they've become more ingrained or I've changed. And I think it's so, so important because a lot of people are on this kind of hamster wheel of doing the same things over and over again. And they wonder why they stay in the same place. And if you're not willing to you know, look at these things often, then how are you supposed to progress and change? And I think self-awareness is probably... You know, something that a lot of people lack because they're not willing to face the, the harsh realities of the things that they're unhappy with doing because that involves having to make some very, you know, very painful decisions, which, which is of course those changes which they need to make, but at the moment don't want to. How did you go about building your own self-awareness? I think a lot of it came from just, uh, if I was to say now what it would be, um, I had a paper round at the age of around 12, 13, 14. And I would get up every morning at 6 a.m., of course, to do the paper round before school. So I spent a lot of time in my head. You know, I think back back in the day there, we didn't have Walkmans and uh, AirPods like I've got on now. You were in your head thinking about things. And I think a lot of it came from there because I would just be thinking about my day, thinking about the things that I wanted. And I've just been, I've always been a very much in my head person. Sometimes people, you know, people that I know, they look at me and go, like, he's a bit distant. And, and my wife's like, he's always distant. He's always in his head <laughs> thinking about things. So... It's actually just, you know, if I think back, it's, it's always been that thing from a teenager of just just thinking things out. And, you know, whenever I get overwhelmed, it's because I haven't got space to write things down and think. As soon as I do, I've, you know, I feel a lot better. It's like, cool. As soon as it's out there and I have at least some form of direction, a lot of that kind of overwhelm, um, you know, subsides. Yeah, there's a level of thoughtfulness that comes across in your content and the things you put out on social media. So that doesn't surprise me. And you mentioned before about the 34 years, 34 lessons in 34 years. And I actually went to Medium and I dug up the one you, you posted back then. And you had a few interesting points. We could go through each one of the 34, for the one that you wrote three years ago and, and discuss each one. And that could be a whole podcast in and of itself. But I just wanted to pull out a couple because they really hit me at a deep level. Your eighth point was you can't expect others to love and value you if you can't love and appreciate yourself. 
Do you remember 100%. what spurred that insight? And if not, like, what can we do to better love ourselves? I think as well, you know, the most important thing, and you know, some of my biggest, surprisingly, the biggest shares and views on my content has been relationships. And I think one of the things that a lot of people struggle with is you know, meeting somebody or having a relationship with somebody. Um, and one of the main reasons for that is you know, they don't love themselves. They, they, they don't accept themselves. So how can you accept somebody else if you're not willing to accept yourself? And what, you know, accepting yourself is, is reminding yourself that it's okay that you're not perfect. And, and I think this is one of the biggest problems that people have that they, they, they're not willing to accept, accept themselves because, you know, they have flaws and they try and hide those flaws or they don't accept those flaws as being okay. Because as soon as you start to realize look, I'm not perfect, I fuck up all the time, you know, um, I make lots of mistakes. I'm impatient at times. I, you know, obsess about things which I shouldn't do. And that's fine. That's absolutely fine. Because what, one thing that happens in a relationship and someone who really changed my life um, from reading was a guy called Alain de Breton. Uh, and he had this post called why, why you'll marry the wrong person. I'm very fortunate that I did marry the right person. I've been with her you know, many, many years. But one of the reasons that we are still together is because we accept fully ourselves for who we are. And most importantly, you know, that, that includes all the flaws that come with that. And that's fine. And, and one of the problems with relationships is that so many people try and hide those flaws and not show them, which means that they're not showing their real self because they're embarrassed or they, they don't want to show that. And then they wonder why they can't develop a deep relationship because you're, that... living, you're, you're living your life as a lie to other people and you're living, a, you're, you know, you're living a lie to yourself as well. I was researching for this podcast and I was listening to a, a previous one you did where you were talking about how in 2016 there was difficulties between you and your employees because you appeared perfect to them and they didn't see you as having any flaws in any way. Was, was that something you worked on as a result of 2016 and before? Yeah, I think one, one of the biggest mistakes that I made in 2016 was something called intellectualization. And one of the issues with that is that I take, before I responded to something emotionally, I would think about it logically first and then make a response. And, and the trouble with doing that is when people come to you with problems, you know, one, one of the amazing things about you know, human beings is when somebody comes to you with a certain emotion, you have these mirror neurons, which essentially, you know, feel that. Um, and my mistake as, you know, as an ex soldier and, you know, that gets taught to, you know, think logic, let emotions, don't let emotions take over because you can get somebody killed. Um, if someone came to me with an issue, I, you know, it would seem as if I'm heartless because I would intellectually try and break it down and then ponder on it afterwards, which some people just didn't need. Some people just needed that, you know, a shoulder to cry on or somebody who empathized and understood. And, and the thing is I did totally, but I wanted to think of the logical solution to best come back to them with the answer, which a lot of the times, um, with us, that's, that's, that's not the way that you do things. So I had to, you know, realize that I, I needed to stop being so in my head with, with people and, and sometimes just smell the flowers and be in the moment and respond how you're feeling, not what the right thing to do is in that moment. And there are times where you should do that and shouldn't. And, you know, when, when we're talking about things online, you know, it's a great example where people should think before reacting is if somebody says something hurtful or negative or hateful to you, and then you respond with something hurtful, negative, or hateful. You know, you need to take that small time to reflect and go, look, it's, this is not about me. This is about them and, and the problems that they're having in their life. That is a great example of actually you know, sometimes intellectualizing something bef before responding. But when it comes to your team, when it comes to your loved ones, when it comes to your family with, that, that know you and you're coming to you, chuck that shit out the window. They, you know, they want you. They come to you for a reason. 
not to hear your logical thoughts on something. So, yeah, I fucked that up big time uh, in 2016. Were there any particular moments on your journey that made that most clear? Um, s- splitting up temporarily from my wife because I just burnt myself out uh, at the end of 2016. Um, not really allowing myself to have close friends. I had friends, but you, you know, um, and and just this this realization of, you know, the the mindset that I was putting myself in sometimes was was serving me in certain aspects, but it was most certainly not helping me in other ones. Um, and it was this kind of realization that you kind of need to measure yourself in life on multiple variables. And for me, that is health, wealth, productivity, and connectivity. The meltdown and management skill. It, yeah, it is. And, um, you know, it's, it's understanding those things because sometimes when you are high on some of them, you're very low on others. A lot of the time when your, you know, your wealth is high, sometimes your, you know, your wealth is high and your productivity is high, your connectivity is very low. Because if your wealth and productivity uh, is really high. You're getting stuff done and, and you're probably, you know, business owner that's actually killing it. But in order to kill it a lot of the times when, especially when you first start out in a business, you need to make sacrifices. And usually those sacrifices come with the people close to you. So this is why that connectivity piece is so important because, you know, when I was, if I was to be using that in 2016, yeah, I'd say health, physical health, I looked fit. I look fit, but mental health was declining. And, and this is what's so important. This is what I explain a lot. Just because you look good on the outside doesn't mean that it's the same on the inside. Um, wealth, you know, I, I, was, I was ticking all the boxes for that. Built a new business, lots of success. Productivity, killing it, you know, ticking every single box that I ever wanted to, you know, uh, tick it that year. Connectivity, zero. Like, and if I'd used that on a daily and weekly basis, I would have, you know, realized that I carry on this way that something's going to break. Is that scale that you mentioned, the health, wealth, productivity, and connectivity, do you, do you rank them one to five every week, every day, every month, or is it just like something in the back of your mind that you're keeping track of? I have um, a, a little thing on my phone which I use at like 7 p.m. every day. And it has that in and it just elaborates it on it a little bit more. Um, and, you know, what I said in one of my books is that, you know, for a lot of the time now, when I have three low days, I know that I need to prioritize that the next week. Um, and, you know, because I've been using it for quite a few years now, and it's such a simple thing, it literally takes someone 30 seconds to do on a daily basis. Um, that I, I've been able to just really notice it because I'm in that habit of, you know, just tracking that thing in the evening that I can make those quick tweaks and changes. And a, and a lot of that comes down to once again, writing things down um, and, and being in tune with things. You know, if I'm feeling overwhelmed or I'm getting anxiety, I need to write things down. Why am I getting anxiety? Why am I feeling overwhelmed? Because then I'm identifying the things that are causing that. Once again, when I'm feeling good, when I'm feeling happy, when I'm feeling excited, these are all important things to write down. Why am I happy? Why am I excited? What am I currently doing in this moment that's making me feel so good? And usually, nine times out of ten, these are simple things that haven't cost much money. Spending time with my kids, going for a dip in the sea, reading a book, you know, giving myself a day off to head off to the spa uh, without my phone. You know, these are simple things which everyone knows that they need to do but but they don't do and what's great about having all of these things is when you do experience emotions and you will of course then you can look at things that you did in the past that resolved those issues so you're kind of ha- you know you kind of hack in your happiness really when it comes to those things and you know a lot of people don't do this they, they really don't you know they don't write things down most certainly and, and they don't they're not in tune with their emotions. And as yeah. soon as you start to realize what triggers you, realize what pisses you off, but also realize what makes you happy, you can do more of the things that make you happy and less of the things that piss you off. 
I'm happy you brought up the Thursday spa days because it, it was something you said that initially you were hesitant to do and you don't bring your phone and it, and it tunes you in to a, a new frequency. And so how did you decide to start doing the spa days and what do you get from, from having that in your part of your weekly routine? So if I rewind back, this was actually 2019 and I was, you know, I had a very stressful year, but it was a very good year, good year because I was having a lot of time off. Um, and I found that I was getting to like Wednesday and I was just getting a little bit, feel, that, feeling that little bit of burnout, yeah, a little bit of exhaustion that I'm probably not going to be able to be at my best on a Thursday and, and, and then I'm going to be fucked by Friday. So I remind myself, look, you know, you're, you can do what the fuck you like, Jay. You know, you're the boss. You can, you can pick your days. And sometimes that uh, we forget that, especially in our own businesses. It's this kind of learned helplessness that we have. So what I said to my wife, I was like, I'm just going to book in, I'm just going to book in a spa day. Like just, just for myself, I'm just going to fuck off. And, and obviously she saw that I was you know, tired and she said, yeah, go and do it. And I booked one up the road and it was amazing. You know, it was brilliant. I went there myself left my phone at home, you know, sat in the jacuzzi, read half a book, had a free course meal f to myself. And I felt guilty as fuck. I was like, yeah, I've got a wife and two kids at home and I'm sitting there in a spa. Um, and then I came back to work on the Friday and I had one of the best, most productive Fridays ever. You know, I had, you know, in business, you know, I, I the content was through the roof. My coaching was through the roof, everything. And then I was kind of thinking, you know, looking at how much it costs for a membership of a spa, but also looking at, you know, that I've got something midweek to look forward to and it boosts my business. It, you know, the return on investment of what it cost me in the spa versus actually how, how better I am in my business the next day would probably be tenfold. So to stop looking at it as a guilty pleasure and start looking at it, at it as an investment. And, and this is something that I say to people all the time, especially as a business owner, especially somebody who has, you know, for myself, hundreds of people that are paying me money and relying on me to do a good job. You, you've got to treat yourself like a million dollar racehorse. And, you know, I heard this somewhere and it, and it's so true. You know, if, if you, if you spent a million dollars on a racehorse, You'd feed it the best food. You'd make sure it gets plenty of sleep and exercise because every time it goes to the race, it fucking wins. And you in your business, you in your life, you're that million dollar racehorse. So why are you treating yourself like a donkey? You know, why are you just, you know, filling your stomach full of shit? Why are you giving yourself four hours sleep? Why are you, and you, and you think that people want to pay you money to, to be that kind of person, you know, and also, are you going to be able to turn up at your best for people who are relying on you to be at your best if you are not treating yourself like you should do? And, and it's a very important thing because it then you understand that, you know, I think it, I've forgotten the quote, but it was fill up your vessel before you help others fill up theirs. And you need to fill your vessel up first. You need to be selfish first and get your shit squared, as I like to say, um, in order to help other people get their shit squared. Are there any particular practices at the spa that are most impactful? Not having my phone with me is definitely one. Have a notepad, certainly, um, and, uh, and, and a book. For me, that and a book. I do, I do enjoy breath work. So I do a lot of breath work in the morning, which I enjoy. Um, and I do, <laughs> I've got this really weird habit. So I'm trying to build up... Um, holding my breath underwater. And I've got to about, got to about three minutes. And it's quite funny because I am the youngest in this spa by about 30, 30 years. Uh, and I'm got, I've got really good, uh, you know, going under the water in the jacuzzi. And one time I went in, uh, it, was, it was about two and a half minutes and I came back up and there was about six people around going, Oh my God, I thought you drowned. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, nah, I just, I, I'm, 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 yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just, I said, I'm just strange. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think one of the one of the lessons you had in the post was embrace your weird, and it's clear you're doing yeah. that by going yeah, to yeah. jacuzzi. Yeah, I mean, I I go for a sea dip every single morning, you know, spring, summer, autumn, winter. Um, so people probably look him in the beach and think, you know, he, he's crazy. Yeah, I, I'm good. I, hands up. You know, something I always used to say to people is, you know, what if I'm not crazy? 
what if I'm normal and just everybody needs to catch up? And it's a great way to look at things because, you know, I'm doing these things because they make me feel normal. And, and, and it's, and it's quite mad that from the outside, people are looking at me as crazy. But what I think is crazy is that there are so many people walking around fucking miserable. That's yeah. crazy. You know, and in order to get out of that misery, sometimes it's about doing difficult things that, that do look crazy, like getting up early and going to the gym and eating healthy food when everyone's not eating healthy food. Uh, and maybe, you know, not going out on a Friday night and actually going to the gym early in the morning on a Saturday. I mean, that's bonkers. You know, you walk up to a group of people, you know, and say how much you drunk last night and how much of a hangover you got. And that seems to be the normal. But you've, if you say, I've just done a 10K run um, and did a 45-minute stretching session, everyone will look, look at you like you're bonkers. It's funny that you've been preaching the same message now for almost a decade. And I say that as a compliment in terms of consistency and clarity of thought to have that same message. I was going back on your Twitter back to 2014, and you'd wrote up a full Facebook post about how – you saw people at brunch on Sunday and, and you were making, it was basically the same thing, exactly what you just said. And it, it just strikes me as, as powerful that you've maintained that same idea of why are people doing this? And so my question to you is what was the last time you felt truly miserable and what do you do to get out of it? So I think is it, is it, why I'm pondering on this a lot is uh, when I do feel miserable, um, once again, I, I ask myself why. And usually it's because I'm not doing the things which I normally do. So if I haven't gone for a sea dip for a few days, if I haven't gone to the gym for a few days, if I haven't had much sleep, if I've been eating shit, you know, it's all those things which I say and then, uh, and then I reflect and go, have you done the things that, you know, you're supposed to do? And the answer is no. And, and, and a lot of the reasons for that is because they're fucking difficult to do. And, yeah. and we get into this pattern, you know, when I say I can't believe people aren't doing this, um, I can believe why people aren't doing it because it's difficult because everything in your body is telling you to do the opposite. And, and here's the thing, like, and I do understand that, which is why I say to people all the time, and I have this quote, you know, hard things, easy life, easy things, hard life. And when you truly understand, I, I remember a John Maxwell quote, and he said that somebody came to him and said, life's hard. And he said, compared to what? Yeah. And it's this assumption that this shit's meant to be easy. And I'm like, no, you've got that <laughs> fucking wrong, mate. This is not meant to be easy. As soon as you realize that... You know, there's going to be so much shit happening to you, you know, with your time on the planet, but also understand that you're going to go through a roller coaster of emotions and feel feelings. You know, you're going to lose loved ones. You're going to have horrible things happen inevitably during your lifetime. And in the end, you're going to be left with two choices. You can allow it to stop you from doing what it is that you want to do or you can allow it to you know, enhance what it is that you're doing. Because if I reflect back to my life, every single thing that's gone right for me has come after one big fuck up, one mistake, you know, one thing that at the moment in time was the worst thing to have ever happened to me. I remember back in 2012, I got made redundant from my job. I had no money. I just put everything into a mortgage with my wife and uh, literally I had nothing. I, I put £16,000 on a credit card, borrowed my dad's bike, uh, jumped on a personal trainer course, rented a studio out up the road uh, and cycled there to work. Three years later, I became one of the most well-known personal trainers in the UK. Had I not been made redundant and have the worst thing happen to me, I wouldn't have been on the path to doing what I actually was, you know, at the time put on the planet to do. I had a massive meltdown in 2016 and ended up moving out from my, from my wife and my family. The worst, you know, st you know, sitting on this floor of this flat, like what the fuck happened? You, you had such a good year last year. 
that, you know, really painful six months paved the way for me being more open to my emotions, understanding myself more, connecting better with my family, you know, disconnecting with people that didn't matter and didn't have the need to get back to everybody. So when I reflect on these times, you know, it's understanding that these can, these can build you or they can break you and, and you get the choice to, you know, to understand that, you know, and when these things do happen to you, remember that you do have a choice in that. It was interesting looking at January 1st, 2019, when you realized that was going to occur, you were going to have a hard year ahead of you. So what do you do on January 1st, 2nd, and 3rd? So 2019, I knew the year ahead of me was I was going to be splitting from my business partners and building a new business from scratch. I knew that my son Archer was coming around the same time that this was happening. And I knew that I, you know, this was going to be uh, a lot of change in my life. And um, so New Year's Eve... I laid out I, I, and I hadn't been doing much fitness for a few weeks of Christmas and I decided to run a marathon on the 1st of January. So I think it was like 4.15 a.m. got up, ran the marathon, took me about five, five and a half hours. You know, I hadn't trained for it whatsoever. You uh, hadn't trained just, for it? No, not at all. I hadn't, I hadn't been really training at all for the whole month of Jan. Uh, sorry, whole month of December. Uh, and then what I decided to do was I decided to do another marathon the next day. So I ran another 26.2 miles. It took me, it was a little bit quicker, about 10 minutes quicker. It's about five hours, 20, you know, we're not going to be setting any new records for this one. And then day three, I decided to get up and go again. And uh, I managed 16 and a half miles. Uh, and yeah, my feet were got, you know, I had no skin left on my feet and I was done. Uh, and I just said to myself, whatever this is that we're doing right now, it was like that kind of Forrest Gump moment, you know, when he just stops running and goes, I think I'm done now. What? And, and, and I call that kind of my Forrest Gump moment because he doesn't know what, he didn't know why he was running. You know, he was running away or running to or, or being in his head. And what that allowed me to do, if you think about the hours, that was, I had about 12, 13 hours in my head going through this pain of doing these marathons but also understanding that, Jay, like if you can run like two and a half back to back marathons the first three days of the year, then you can pretty much deal with anything that's going to come at you this year. And, and, and by the time I got to that mile 16 of the third day, I was just like, we're, we're good. We're, we're good. We, we, can, we can deal with this shit. And, and I think that's what it was all about. People always ask me why I did it. And it was just that, you know, I, I, one of the things that, and I'm not even sure if it's a talent or skill, but I, I'm able to deal with uh, a lot of physical pain. Um, and sometimes I just need to remind myself of that. And you know, I've done a lot of crazy events over the years to, to test this thing. And, you know, and, and being in that time where you are in that kind of physical pain and you do have the option of going, well, we can, we can stop like everything in my body is telling me right now, just what you're doing, just stop. Or we can just go for a little bit longer. Just give it 30 minutes, give it an hour. And, and then you realize that you actually have got the strength to carry on going. It's very powerful when you get that kind of second wind, especially after, you know, 45 minutes, an hour ago, we were just ready to give up and everyone has that in them. And actually that's what that kind of magic of life is because you are going to get those dips as Seth Godin likes to call it where you, you know, everything in your body, everything, everything or every person around you is telling you just stop. Um, and sometimes it's a good idea to stop depending on what it is, but other times it's a case of shutting out the noise, just pushing a bit further and then realizing that, you know, you're going to achieve great things if you do that. What are the best ways to be comfortable with discomfort in general? As with anything, it, you know, the only way to get better at talking on video is to spend more time talking on video. You know, people say I'm shit at video. I'm like, when's the last time you did video? Two years ago. We well, are always going to be shit, aren't you? If you want to get better at being uncomfortable, 
become do something uncomfortable daily. Start your day with something uncomfortable. And I'm and you know, what I do is I go for you know a dip in the sea. It's getting a little better now. It's still cold, but not as cold as the winter periods. But it's just this understanding of, you know, what we're training is not you know, people ask me about, oh, what are the physical benefits of jumping in the sea? And I say, like, it has more mental benefits because I don't want to do it. And so many people, they don't want to get up early. They don't want to exercise. They don't want to, you know, they don't want to do all of these things. But what you need to train is discipline. And, and something that I've always said to people is that, you know, if you go onto YouTube, and you, most people are looking for motivational videos. And what a motivational video will do is you'll listen to it and hopefully it will fire you up for about five or 10 minutes, maybe even an hour. Great. But what's going to happen is you're just going to keep relying on a, an external factor in order to get something done. Good luck keeping consistent with that because if you only do things when you're motivated, you won't get fuck all done. Now, discipline is very different. Because motivation is doing things when you feel like doing it or when something's pumped you up to do it. But discipline is doing things regardless of how you feel. And I always call this as a second voice. And you've got to train that second voice. Every single morning, people think I, you know, strip my clothes off and go and, and you know, prance into the sea with a smiling face. I don't. I look at the sea and go, fuck this. It's freezing. Fuck this, it's wavy. It's dark. You know, all these things. And I, I say exactly the same things as every other person would say in that situation. But because I do it daily, I get this second voice that comes into my head and goes, Jay, shut the fuck up and get in the sea. If I can't be asked to go to the gym because I'm tired, this, you know, I say, so just don't go today. And this second voice comes into my head and goes, Jay, shut the fuck up and go to the gym. Um, and sometimes when I'm really, really like not looking forward to it, the second voice comes in and says, right. And, and, I take example of a sea deck. There are times where I really didn't want to jump in the sea, but there are worse things down the seafront to do than just going for a dip in the sea. There is rock pools with crabs in, uh, and there are certain rock pools which are like you can whole body immerse. So sometimes this voice, and I sound like a crazy person now, but let's just roll with it. It says to it, well, do you know what you're going to do? Cause you don't want to go in the sea. You're going to go in that rock pool instead. And then you're going to go in the sea. And the funny thing about this voice is he knows what he's talking about because when I do the rock pool and go in the sea, when I've done the thing, I feel absolutely incredible. And then I remind myself, imagine what you were feeling like before doing it and imagine how you're feeling right now. And when you, and it's kind of a dichotomy discipline because with motivation, you want to feel good before doing something. But when you truly understand discipline, it's about feeling good after you've done something. So if you can remind yourself and get that second voice to say, we're doing it anyway, because you know, deep down, you're going to feel good when you've done it. And then you, re and then, you know, the only thing that that second voice says to me once I've done it is see, <laughs> and it's just that, but it's a daily reminder. This is not something that you master. This is something that you, you deal with every single day. And every day you will have this narrative in your head. So whatever it is that you want to do, cold showers, sea dips, early morning walks, early morning runs, early morning stretch, you know, getting your 30 minutes of work done, reading a chapter of a book. The, the, everyone has a different definition of difficult in their life. Find what that is, commit to it, and start building up that second voice in your head. Why do you think we so consistently are unable to realize that we are happy with doing the difficult thing, right? I also, when I go to the gym, when I go for a run afterwards, I'm like, wow, this is amazing. But before I didn't want to do it. And this is common with what you just said as well. But why don't we learn that we are, we should do it. We, it actually makes us feel good. Like why isn't that instilled in our brain? If you think about the rewards of the brain. Because we're waiting for somebody to come and save us. We we're hope we are hoping that somebody is going to suddenly have the answers, give it to us and, and change our lives. You know, think about this. 
a lot of us, like we'll quite happily let ourselves down, but we find it very hard to let other people down. So think about this, like if you had a gym partner that was relying on you to go to the gym at a certain time, you'd probably go to the gym. If you had somebody who goes for a dip in the sea with you, you'd probably go dip in the sea because you rely on each other. Um, and I always say this people, like no one's coming, no one's coming to save you. Um, and, and, it, and it is that thought process. I, I, like to call, I like to call it this. Like, have you seen The Truman Show with, um, with Jim Carrey? Yeah, explain it to people who haven't heard it, though. So it. basically, I, I don't want to spoil it all, but go, go and watch it. Basically, uh, Jim Carrey was born into a TV program. And this was a giant fake earth dome that had cameras around and followed him 24 hours a day. It was one of these shows that, you know, people streamed 24 hours and he was the star. And the reason it started is because he didn't know that it was a show and he was being watched and everything was being, um, you know, narrated with every, everything in it. And I like to look at my life sometimes like that. I'm like, like to think, is what you're doing now, if this was a TV show, would people look at you as inspirational or full of shit? <laughs> and if I'm doing something that I shouldn't do, i.e. skipping my seed up or skipping the gym, the only person, you know, that, that, should mat that should matter to is me. Because it comes, it all falls back to that hard things, easy life. Not doing the hard thing you know, is easy to do there and then, but it just makes other things more difficult to do the rest of the day. You know, if I'm not looking after my nutrition because it's difficult and I'm not going for a run and looking after my exercise because it's difficult, I'm then becoming unhealthy, unfit, and I'm probably going to get more triggered. You know, I'm probably going to look at somebody who is fit and healthy and, and, and be kind of envious and angry with them. I could be looking at somebody who is successful and who's doing really well on social media or with their business and then start to feel hateful or resentful for that. And you see this online. You see people put so much hate in. And a lot of that is because the, what those people are doing is they're holding up a mirror in front of them saying, you're not doing the fucking work. And it's a very hard pill to swallow because what that person has done is just decided to take the easy route for too long. And, and once again, this shit is not easy, but it's all about having these, these, for me, it's these quotes and these mental models and these pictures in your head to go to when you do experience these difficult things. Such as I said, like if somebody was watching this as a TV program now, would they be inspired or would they think who the fuck's this and that simple thing can just make you reflect on the things that you're doing and that might actually make you you know change your mind uh, another thing that i always say to people all the time is what you practice in private you will be rewarded for in public you know n although i do record my c dips i've got enough c dips now to to post on my instagram for people to think i've done a c dip I don't actually post any of my workouts at all anymore because I coach personal trainers in their business, not with fitness. So if I wanted to, I could not go to the gym because I'm not being, you know, people aren't following me for my physique. And in fact, I had someone on my Q&A say, do you, do you still go to the gym? Because I, haven't, I don't see you post about going to the gym anymore. And it came back to this. Yeah, I can assure you I'm, I'm in just as good a shape, if not better. Um, since you know before i was a personal trainer because i love going to the gym but also i love doing hard things and actually i get the reward from doing it because once again i'm practicing that in private now i don't need an audience to you know convince me to go to the gym i know why i'm going to the gym because i want to stay on this planet as long as humanly possible so you mentioned what you do in private often people see in public but it just takes takes some delayed time take us through day 29 of your cold shower challenge and what happened on day 29? I think it was, yeah. Um, so I've always, and I've always wanted to do C dips. In fact, I remember walking past maybe about four years ago in October, some, some guy walking down to the beach and I sat there and go, he's not going to swim in. It's fucking freezing. <laughs> and oh, and oh yes, he did. I was like, guys, that guy's nuts. <laughs> 
guy's crazy. <laughs> a little did I know four years later, I was going to be that crazy person. But I'd always wanted to do it. And I thought, see, the sea's a bit extreme for me at the moment, so I'm going to do cold showers. And I said, well, I'm going to do a 30-day cold shower. Every, every day I do you know, a minute, two minutes in the shower. First day, horrible. Felt a little bit good afterwards, but horrible. Second day, horrible. Third, oh, and I got 10 days in. I was like, why do people do this? Why? Uh, and I actually got to day 14. And uh, I was like, this is weird. I'm going under this cold shower and it's not as cold as it is anymore. So that anticipation's not as bad. It was, you know, this kind of adaptation to it. Uh, and as you say, I went to day 29 and I was going in uh, for a swim and uh, I went to go under the shower and one of the guys there said, don't go in there. They're f don't go in those showers. They're freezing cold. Little did he know that I'm on day 29 of a cold shower challenge. So I remember pressing the button, smiling at him, and obviously having a shower as if it was nice and warm. And his face said it all. He, he just looked at me and goes, like, as if I'd just done some kind of wizardry magic or something. And that just solidifies my point of what you practice in private, you're rewarded for in public. Because I, I, I can still remember the look on his face when I just went under this, went under this shower and just looked, you know, didn't even flinch just because... At that time, of course, I, I was on day 29 of my cold shower challenge. And I think that, that, that there solidified, you know, why we do difficult things every single day. And, and it's the same with a lot of things. When your habits are on point, when you are reflecting, when you're in a good place physically, mentally, financially, spiritually, whichever one you want to do, you give zero fucks what anybody else thinks because you're in a good place. So if someone comes at you, if someone says, Hey, if someone gets angry with you, you have the ability just to shrug it off or just, you know, look at it from, from a good point of view as in that person's not attacking me. That person's I'm good. That person's just having a bad day. And, and, and your mindset is more about how can I make that person's day better? Not how fucking dare you speak to me like that. And I've been in multiple situations of that, which have been resolved very, very quickly because I fill up my cup first. One thing I notice from hearing you speak is I listened to you in, in previous episodes, you in 2016, and you, you were a great speaker then. But even today, it's like the way you are able to illustrate thoughts via stories and examples and just the way you speak is so powerful. And I l watched you in 2010, you posted your first video. It didn't sound like that at all. And so what, what elements make for a great speaker other than just doing it many, many, many times? I, I think one of the most important things is taking people on a journey, mm. pausing, pacing, uh, tonality. These are all things that can be practiced over time. One of the main things for me as well is a lot of the content that I do, it, it gets cut, you know, it gets cut down into a lot of short clips. And I, I you know, I've been obsessed with editing for, for many years. Yeah, you know, I've done pretty much a lot of my own stuff for many years. And it's, uh, a lot of the time it was just accidental because I was like, I need to speak a lot slower and have better pacing so I can cut the video easier. But what actually happened from doing that is, you know, it was more impactful because it allowed those, like those gaps allowed me to cut it quicker. But also when you're on more of a long form podcast or you're doing a live stream, it allows people to ponder on what it is that you said. And that is so important because when you're talking very fast and you're going, you know, taking someone on a path and a journey, and then you're going to the next path and journey, they're still trying to figure out the last path. So they're like, oh, hang on a minute. I just need time to process this. And I have found this sometimes when you have a very fast speaker that I've had to rewind just so I could ponder on what it is that they said. And if I think now, you know, as you said, 2010 posted my first video. I'm 12 years into my, into my journey. My first hire in my business in 2015, my first employee 
was a full-time videographer, not a VA, not all the things that you should have in your business. It was a full-time videographer because I realized that this video thing I wanted to get very good at. And there's nothing better at getting good at something than paying someone a lot of money to knock on your door at 9 a.m. with a camera ready to film whatever it is that you have to film for the day. Because first I've got, to fi- I've got to find something for him to film because I'm paying him. And I've got to be the person, you know, in the camera talking um, and, and doing. So actually I got very, very good because seven, you know, more or less five to six days a week, I was having a camera follow me around and documenting everything I was doing. So, you know, vi- video for me has been a, a massive thing over the last 10, you know, 10 years. And, you know, it's changed my life. It really, really has just beating on a craft and a skill uh, that you want to do. And I say this with a lot of my coaches, you know, if you can get good at talking on video, public speaking and writing, you'll never need to worry about being successful. You'll never need to worry when the next paycheck's coming because you have the ability to communicate your message to the world and put it out there. Yeah, I think Jordan Peterson said something remarkably similar, which was, if you can write and speak, you're absolutely deadly. Everybody should learn how to do that. And it's it's a powerful skill that you've clearly developed. So kudos to you. And uh, it's, it's incredible to see. One thing I wanted Thank to you. talk to you about was your long-term view on TikTok. A lot of times in these interviews, people will ask you, dude, how are you making money? from TikTok. And you're like, well, I'm actually thinking about it in a 10 year time horizon. And what I'm actually trying to do is the next Elon Musk or some young person who starts a successful company, they're going to remember me. They're going to remember that and I'll get paid 50,000 or a hundred thousand dollars for speaking on the back end of that. And that approach is so rare and so beautiful to see somebody of your skill level do and somebody of your caliber do. So talk to me about that decision and how that came to be. I think one of the biggest things I explain to people is the same day you plant the seed isn't the same day you pick the flower. And a lot, and a lot of people come to me and they say, Jay, I want to create a YouTube channel because I want a million subscribers and I want to earn hundreds of thousands of dollars a month in ad revenue. And I'm like, you are already going to fail because the people that are at, on that platform now doing that did that eight years ago and they were doing it for the love of producing video and content, not for earning money from it. And, and, and that is the reason that they earn a lot of money from it. And for me, you know, a lot of people want to know why are we doing, you know, how much money are you earning from TikTok? And I'm like, well, this is why you don't have a big following because you are thinking about making money from your following. And something that I say to people all the time is if you focus on impact over income, the income will come. You've just got, you've just got to be paid and you've just got to be patient. And by patient, I don't mean wait six months or a year. I know 100% everything that I'm doing when I'm posting a piece of content on my social media platforms, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm putting a check in the bank that I can't cash yet. And I don't know when I can cash it, but there will be major, there will be big paydays throughout my life. And I will look back on, and I've had plenty of opportunities already from things that gone, if I hadn't have done those things, I wouldn't have had that. You know, an example of this is 2017, Facebook flew me out to Los Angeles for two weeks, all, all expenses pays, business class flights, everything, all because they wanted to display what I'd been doing on Facebook with their creative program. And had I not gone all in on Facebook, you know, in 2011, I wouldn't be flying there to have, you know, to be in front of some, some of the top creators in the world um, with them showing what it is that I've done. So, and it's just about understanding that, yes, you need to make money with things. And and I do make very good money uh, in my business, but I don't, you know, I don't really plug or promote or push anything uh, on TikTok. I I don't know where it's going to go yet. You know, a lot of the things I'm doing 
for example, I've been on TikTok since 2019. It's been an incredible journey. I think, you know, three years we're up to three quarters of a million followers. And, you know, if I think about my outcome um, goal with that, I might write a third book. So that might be a, a big thing which I focus on, uh, especially if that is relevant to the audience on TikTok that, you know, that listen and watch my work. And that one book could, you know, have a massive transformation, not only on other people's lives, but, but my, my life too. Well, I'm looking forward to hopefully having you back on this podcast if you decide to write that third book, because there's so much wisdom in what you've done, what you've accomplished and, and what you've built for yourself. So thank you so much for, for taking the time here today. I'm really grateful for you. And um, any final closing words? Mm, final. I'll I want to leave people with what I always say uh, on, my, on the end of my podcast. And it is what you put in your body affects how you look and how you feel. And, and what you put in your head affects what you think and what you do. Beautiful. That's beautiful. And I always remember that. And where can people connect with you further, Jay? Best place to connect uh, is TikTok and or Instagram at Jay Alderton. Cool. We'll put those both below. Thank you so much for your time and your wisdom. Thank you, Danny. Appreciate it.